I want to welcome our other locations as well as our online viewers. If you're new, my name is Jeremy. Welcome to Crosstown. Uh, we are starting a uh, brand new short series, two-week series today called Seeing 2020. It's clever, isn't it? So clever. And uh, it's all about seeing God's vision for our lives as we start a brand new year, making sure that, that God is our priority, but also seeing God's purpose and vision for our church as well. A little short series before we jump into the Gospel of John, which is going to lead us all the way up until Easter, uh, looking through the life, death, and, and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the Gospel of John, today we're going to be in Philippians. Uh, so if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and turn with me there. I want to talk about having a 2020 vision for our lives. Um, I got these glasses. These are actually Aiden's. Our boys got these neat glasses. They all have glasses. I'm going to see if Jojo wants to come up and show you his glasses. He, come on, bud. You want to do it? He, he was so inclined to do it in the first service. Now he's being shy. You're being shy. You're never shy. That's okay. Check them out in Wellsville. You'll check them out at, at the end of this service. But all the boys got different colored glasses. These are special glasses called blue light glasses. You ever heard of them? Okay. I hadn't either until my wife bought a pair and the boys got a pair. They all love them. Yes, Owen, go ahead. Oh, you'll, you'll get them in a little bit. For those of you who've been a part of our church for any length of time, you know that Owen has a tendency to interrupt my sermons <laughs> randomly. He did that when we opened our arcade campus. We tested the live stream out, and he just walked from the nursery to the, the stage. So he has a, a tendency to do that. Uh, but we, we got these blue light glasses. The point of blue light glasses, as my wife tells me, because I don't know much about this, is to block out the bad light and to allow good light. It lets the good light in, think about this, and blocks out the bad light or what's called blue light. If you look at devices or a computer screen or a TV late at night, sometimes you have trouble sleeping. It's because of this thing called blue light. These glasses, the handy dandy glasses, are designed to actually block out the bad and allow the good to come in. Think about that. That's what I would hope that you would take out of this short two-week series, that you would have a vision for your life. This is a visual illustration, okay? To allow the good to come in and to allow God's word, the, the, the purpose, the vision for your life to block out that which is bad. It's kind of like going to a doctor's office. I haven't done this in a long, long time. I haven't seen the doctor in a long time. Sorry, Dr. Keith. But um, but you go to a doctor's office, they check your eyesight, right? Can you see? And so they put you however many feet away from this thing, this eye chart. You ever done this before? You ever do it and, and it's like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what that is. You're messing up like letters like M for E's and it's just all over the place, right? What would the doctor then do? Gives you a prescription for a lens so that it'll correct your vision so that you can see 2020. That's what, that's what happens when we look to Scripture, when our life is kind of going this way and that way, we can't see clearly God's direction for our lives. God gives us wisdom and direction through the lens, through his word. That's what we're going to do today. Simply look at a passage of Scripture from Philippians chapter 3, where Paul writes to this church to give them a clear vision of where they are to go forward from that point forward. And I want to give you the context here, because we're only going to read like one or two verses. Most of the time, these verses get thrown out of context. I want you to understand that, that what we're going to read today is different than just setting goals, right? We've talked about goal setting before, and that's typically what people think about this time of year. They have resolutions, which last probably for the next maybe three weeks, and then they're over, right? Most resolutions are over by the end of, uh, beginning of February. And so I'm not necessarily talking about resolutions today. I don't have anything against resolutions. I don't have anything about goals. But I want you to see the context in which Paul is asking us to strain ahead and have a clear vision. In fact, the title uh, above my passage uh, in Philippians chapter 3, verse 12, is, is simply straining toward the goal. And the question should, we should ask is, what goal? What goal? Because it matters what goal you have. If you have a goal, you understand that it takes tremendous effort, time, focus, and attention to achieve a goal. And you probably have goals. You might have resolutions. The question is, is it the right goal? Is it the right resolution? Because where you put your goal, what you focus your goal on, determines where your energy and time and focus goes. The question today that we should answer is, do we have a goal worth pursuing? Straining toward what goal? So go back, I'm going to read the context, you won't see this on the screen, but go back a couple verses in chapter 3. This is what the Apostle Paul says. He says this, 
Um, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. And then he says that I may know him. Who's him? Give me the Sunday school answer. Come on. Jesus. That I may know Jesus and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. That's his goal. Becoming like him. Jesus was the goal that Paul was straining towards. And then he says in verse 11 that by any means possible, so it's like hyper-focused goal, by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. So it's a personal goal. It's about Jesus. It was a godly goal. It was about becoming more like him. And it was a future goal. It wasn't um, preoccupied with temporal things. Nothing wrong with temporal things. We live in a temporal world. We have to do temporal things. And we want to get better at those things. But if it's not with eternal things as the priority, the resurrection that is to come, we can often just get preoccupied with lesser things, not focusing on a greater goal. So the question is, do you have a godly goal? Let Paul and his word in Philippians to this church encourage you today. So this is what he says in verse 12. You'll see this on the screen. Paul says, not that I have already obtained this or am already Perfect. Think about who's writing this, okay? This isn't Pastor Jeremy writing this. This isn't you writing this. This is the super apostle Paul writing this. Not that I've already obtained this or am already perfect, but I, help me out, church, I what? Press on. That's the challenge that we need to walk into 2020 with. I need to press on and get this phrase, make it my own, make it my own, because Christ Jesus had made me his own. We need to make God our goal because ultimately God made us his goal. Why would, why would God be the top priority in our life? Why would pursuing Jesus be the top priority of our life? Why would it take precedent over every other lesser goal in our life? We make it our own. Why? Because he made us his own. He has got to be his goal. His majesty, his, his faithfulness, being faithful to him has got to be our top priority. Make it my own. Put your own name in there. Make it my own. Make Paul's goal your goal. Before you get into other goal setting, before you start worrying about other things and what you want to accomplish in 2020, make Paul's goal your goal. Have a godly goal in mind. And then he says this in verse 13. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own. But one thing I do, then he's going to like say what pressing on means. He says, but one thing I do. Actually, he gives two things. And here's the two things. Forgetting what lies behind and straining toward what lies ahead. So he gives us like an idea of what pressing on means. And he gives us the reason why we should press on. I don't know about you, but um, most people here probably would agree, I want to grow. I want to get better at something. I want to grow spiritually. Most people here would say, I want, I want to grow. But I want you to recognize what Paul says. In order to grow, you have to acknowledge that you haven't yet arrived. In order for you to go further in your relationship with God, you have to first recognize that you're not there yet. And that's okay. But you can't let that reality that you're not there yet and that, that, that obstacle, that challenge of that you're not there yet, defeat you of not pressing forward. I mean, if anyone could have said, I have arrived. If anyone could have said in the history of the world, uh, 2020, I don't need to press on too much. I can kind of take my foot off the pedal. I don't need to lean in towards God as much. I mean, I can kind of take it easy. It would have been Paul. At this point, he's done a lot. He's in prison for his faith. He's pursuing God. And he, the context, remember, is him becoming more like Christ. He says, I'm not even there yet. So he first acknowledged that as he needed to grow, he first needed to acknowledge that he wasn't, he wasn't there yet. He hadn't yet arrived. And so for us in, in our life, we need to recognize that as well. Um, now, don't get me wrong. God accepts you where you are. This isn't like a, a message where you got to become a certain level of Christian in order to get right with God. But while God accepts us where we are, he loves us enough to not let us stay there either. 
And the message where he says, press on, we need to get into our hearts, but we cannot become complacent in our walk with God. We need to have the heart to press on, to not grow complacent. And the second thing that we need to do is kind of the flip side. We can't get so overwhelmed by this monumental task of becoming more like Christ and being defeated by who, what we've done in the past that we get discouraged, right? Can't get discouraged. Paul's like, Don't, you're not there yet. But could you stop for a minute and say, I'm not there yet, but at least I'm not who I once was. I mean, if you rewind the tape last year, hopefully you've grown closer to Christ. If you rewind the tape um, you know, five, years from now, uh, five years ago, hopefully you can see some growth. You say, I'm not who I once was. I'm not there yet, but at least I'm not who I once was. God is changing me. Otherwise, you, you, life is a way of kicking you when you're down. Have you noticed that? Life is a way of knocking the sails out of, or the wind out of your sails. Have you noticed that? And so you can get so discouraged by being defeated that you stop pressing on. So the the two messages that Paul has for us right off the bat is don't get complacent and don't grow discouraged. Then you got to press on. So what does it mean to press on? He gives, he says one thing, but it's, it's really two things. The first one is this. It's obvious. He says, forgetting what lies behind. First of all, in order to move forward, you can't be pulled back by something in the past. You can't have something weighing you down if you want to move forward in your relationship with God. You can't be holding on to the past when God wants to place something in your hands. You have to let go. Let go. You have to let go in order to take hold of what God has for you. And so I looked up, I was interested um, to see what this word forgetting means. I know it's obvious, but... I forget sometimes, you know, you can relate to this, but I thought it was interesting when you looked at the original language, which I'm not even going to attempt to say, but I like the the definition. It says neglecting, forgetting means neglecting, which you would probably assume. It means no longer caring for. I thought of that, I thought of like um, feeding something in the past, like giving nourishment to. Paul's like, don't give nourishment to that thought. Don't give nourishment to that 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 negative thought. Don't give nourishment to that shame. Don't feed it because if you feed something, it grows. If you feed something, it survives. If you feed something, it lives in the future. Don't care for that. Don't nourish it. And then it's forgotten. I love this next definition. It's if that was, if the first few definitions wasn't obvious enough, the next one is clear, right? Given over to what? Oblivion. I like that. It's like gone. It's demolished. It's, it's, non-existent. It's, it's given over to oblivion. He says, anything that prevents you from moving forward in your relationship with God, anything that draws your attention away from your relationship with God, forget it. What could that be? That could be, that could be maybe forgiving someone. Uh, I think it's Hebrews that says, don't let a root of bitterness um, grow up. So maybe for you, maybe if you ask, what do I need to forgive? What is one thing that God is placing in my heart, in my mind right now in this moment when I read Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, that God is telling me to forgive, to forget? Maybe it's a person that you need to reconcile with. Maybe it's something that you need to let go and live in the past where it belongs. Maybe it's something that you wish would have happened last year, but it didn't happen I mean, if you keep starting sentences with, if only, or I wish, maybe that's an indication that that's not where God has you and you need to let that go, let it it live in the past. What's one thing? Maybe it's a mistake that you've made that's causing shame. Maybe it's a sin that you've committed that you need to confess. I love what 1 John 1, 9 says, that if you confess, God is faithful and just, and he will forgive you of that sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. But if you keep holding on to that memory and not realize that Romans 8.1 says there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, you haven't really embraced that identity. You know what Satan loves to do? Satan loves to rub our noses into our past failures, our mistakes, and our regrets. And the reason why he wants to rub our noses into who we once were is because when we're so busy getting our nose rubbed into who we once were and those mistakes that we can't look up and see the true identity that we have in Christ. He wants to get you to think about that your identity is in who you once were. Where God says Jesus, through him and and what he did on the cross, has already stamped his approval on your life. He's already offered reconciliation. He's already offered forgiveness. He's already offered grace. That's your true identity. But the thing is, if you're being tugged, 
from behind based off of who you once were, what you once did, you're not able to embrace and to open up your hands to receive your true identity in Christ. He says, one of the reasons why you got to let go is because it'll prevent you from pressing on. If you don't forget, then you can't press on. And a great litmus test of whether whether you've forgotten, let's put it this way, if you're still thinking about it, you haven't forgotten it, right? If you're still... talking about it, you haven't forgotten about it. If you're still bringing it up in the conversation and throwing it in someone's face, you haven't forgotten about it yet. You haven't let it go. Paul says you need to forget about it. I heard a, a great quote recently uh, went like this. The past is like a rudder that is supposed to guide us. The past is like a rudder that's supposed to guide us, not an anchor that's supposed to hold us down. So we learn from the past. We learn lessons from the past but we don't let the past define us. We are new creatures in Christ. So that's the first thing he says, forgetting what is, what is behind. What do you need to forget? What do you need to let go of? Who do you need to forgive? What do you need to move on from? It's a clear message. Forget what's behind. And then the second part of that, in order to press on, is to strain towards what's ahead. Strain towards what, what's ahead. Um, the original language, the definition of that word strain is probably what you would think it would mean. It's to reach forward to, to reach out, to stretch forward to, but it implies physical exertion. It's strenuous activity. It's kind of like um, if you're over 30 or 40 years old, you could probably relate to this. Um, um, when you wake up and you stretch it's a very strenuous process that sometimes makes you wonder if you're going to pop something out of place, right? You ever done that, old people, right? I can, I can relate. I tore my ACL when I was 30. When I wake up in the morning, my leg still twitches sometimes, and I stretch and I strain, and I wonder, did I just tear my ACL again? I mean, it's, I'm that old, right? And it, it hurts, but you stretch towards something. It's not like a halfway stretch. It's a full-out grasping towards something that you do not yet have, and it can take some effort. So what's one thing that God is putting in your heart right now? One thing that God is putting in your heart and putting in your mind that you need to strain towards. Remember, a godly goal, not just some worldly temporal thing, but a godly goal that God is putting in your heart that you need to strain towards. And is that worth pursuing? For you, maybe it's knowing God more through reading the Bible more, right? That would be a godly goal. To not just think about it, to not just feel like you should do it, but actually having a plan in 2020 where you actually do that. Maybe it's spending more intentional time praying. You pray without ceasing, you pray throughout the day, I just pray as things come along, well that's good, but do we have a time where we're spending with the Lord praying? Or maybe for you it's a new ministry opportunity. You know that you're Christ's follower, God has placed a spiritual gift in your life, but you're not doing anything with it. That's a shame. I really think that's a shame. There's so many Christians that are a part of the church, the body of Christ, that are limp, you know, body parts, not doing anything where they were actually created for a purpose to serve the body of Christ, to edify the body of believers, but they're not doing anything with the spiritual gift that they've been given. Maybe God is calling you to a new ministry opportunity to strain towards. Maybe it's a discipline or a habit that you need to pick up or maybe stop doing. What is it that God's calling you to strain forward towards? And then ask the all-important question, is that a godly goal worth pursuing? Is it worth the pursuit? A lot of, a lot of um, people this time of year have physical fitness goals, right? That's why the gym is packed right now. Can't find a parking spot. Just give it a few days. It'll be wide open, right? It's hard to find a treadmill right now, but a couple days from now, those treadmills will all be wide open. Why? Because results take a lot of effort, right? Want to lose weight, you got to put in the work. You know, if you don't do the work, you don't see the results. And so when it takes a lot of effort, some people just say that's not worth straining towards. It's a biblical principle called reaping and sowing sowing and reaping. You don't reap what you don't sow. And so if you want to know God more and read the Bible more, but you don't have a plan, you reap what you sow. There's no strategic plan to get into God's word, which we'll talk about in just a second. You'll reap what you sow. If you want to know God more and to seek him first, but the first thing that you do in the the morning is pick up your phone and check Facebook, you reap what you sow. 
If God is calling you to step out into a new ministry opportunity to use your gifts that he's giving you, it takes faith. A lot of times where we're at, where God calls us to be, there's a gap in the middle, and it requires faith. If we're not willing to sow, you'll never reap. You have to put in the work to strain, to show some strenuous activity to see the results. And Paul's asking us this question, is your goal worth the strain? Is what you're pursuing worth the pursuit? One of our um, core values at our church, I love this. It's the very first one that we agreed upon, and it's the very first one that we um, wrote up years ago, but it's on this side of the sanctuary at all of our locations except for Greece. By the way, Greece is watching for the first time today through the live stream, which I thought was cool. So welcome them. I forgot to welcome them earlier. My bad. Um, Pastor John's there visiting with Pastor Levi. But one of our core values is God is the goal. And underneath that core value, it says there's no greater pursuit in life than knowing God, which means that if you get the right goal, if if your pursuit is in the right goal, it will affect every other area of your life. If you have the wrong goal, it won't affect any other area of your life. Having a godly goal is always worth the pursuit, which is why Paul says later on, verse 14, if we can put verse 14 back up again, and if not, you you can listen. But he says, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Think about that. Everything that Paul went through, first of all, he's writing this letter from prison. Okay, so you think your circumstances are bad in 2020. Think again. At least you're not in prison. It might be hard. Circumstances might not be ideal. But every single change that God is calling you to make, Every single thing that God is calling you to forget and every single thing that God is calling you to strain forward towards, he's saying, because there's an end in mind, because God is calling us heavenward, not temporal, but eternal, and when that is in mind, every single change that God is calling you to make right now is worth the pursuit. Every single change is worth the pursuit because there's an end in mind. I don't know if any of you like running marathons. I don't. Um, can't relate to this illustration too much, but I've tried running a little bit. My senior year, I ran cross country. That's only like three miles. And I could barely get through that. And the reason why I could barely get through that is because I couldn't mentally picture the finish line. Like it was just running out in nature. There was no track. I couldn't see it. I hated it, right? The reason why people can finish marathons or half marathons or 5Ks or maybe a cross-country race is because they're really good at picturing the end in mind. When you have something in mind, you'll endure great pain. You'll strain. You'll forget. You'll let go. The big idea here that Paul's getting at is we need to press on. Can't grow complacent and we can't get discouraged. We need to press on. The way we press on is by forgetting what is behind. And while you can't change the past, you can forget about it. And while you can't change the past, there's certain things that you can do in the present that will affect your future. It's always worth the pursuit. I love the, um, the imagery of a windshield and a rearview mirror. I was thinking about that this morning. If, if um, I, I know some bad drivers, but if all you do is look in the rearview mirror, guess what? You're going to crash. And some of you are living life like that. Some of you are driving down the, the highway of life going... right? Because you're so focused on what happened. You're so focused on what you did. You're so focused on what they did to you. You're so focused on the shame. You're so focused on the sin. You're so focused on that, that thing, right? That you're not keeping your eyes forward to what God has called you to do. Rear view mirror is important. It's great. But it's only meant to glance at. It's only meant to give you a perspective. Aren't you grateful that the windshield is a whole lot bigger, Imagine if you had to drive out of a rearview mirror-sized windshield. What God is calling us towards is always worth the pursuit, and it's worth the changes that he's calling you to make spiritually in 2020. Other goals, great. But if you get the right goal, it will impact all other goals. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to seek to learn and know God more in 2020 as a church. In two weeks, January 19th, we're going to study through the Gospel of John. I'm showing you this Bible in particular. I've showed you this before with our Roman series in Acts. This is a journal Bible. I'd encourage you perhaps to look and check something like this out. Maybe you already have a journal. You already have a Bible. You can put those two together and do the same thing. But this is neat. And uh, what I'll do is read and then write notes. 
And I'll share some of those things with you as we go through this series. But we're going to roll out a reading plan on January 20th as a church that will push through the app that you could follow along. So for three months as a church, we're going to do the same thing. If you don't like that plan, I love what Erin did. My wife did recently. She posted on Facebook. She beat me to the punch on the, on the reading plan. But she wanted to learn the Bible more, uh, know God more. And so she, rather than do like three chapters or four chapters a day, posted the challenge that she'll read one chapter a day for three years, and that will get her through the whole Bible. She posted it, and this is what I love about godly goals. The godly goals that you set not only impact you, but they impact other people. And everybody jumped on that comment section. There's so many people, not just here in Wellsville, but at other campuses that are doing that plan. And if you choose her plan over what I'm telling you, that's okay. I won't be mad at you, right? We want you to know God. The way we know God is by putting on the right lens. The right lens for us to get 2020 vision is what? It's scripture. It gives us clear thinking so that we can block out the bad and embrace the good that God is calling us heavenward towards. I want to invite our worship teams to come forward. And as we close at all of our campuses, I'm going to pray. As we pray, I'm going to give you a little bit of time, and I want you to think. Ask God to speak to you clearly now, and ask him to reveal one thing that he's calling you to forget, one thing that he's calling you to strain towards. We'll pray in silence, and then I'll close us. Lord, we ask right now that you would give us the ability to press on, to not grow discouraged or complacent in our walk with you. God, help us have the same spirit that Paul had, that in the midst of his difficulties and trials and struggles in life that were very, very real, they weren't just theoretical, but he was going through it, Lord, that you gave him um, persistence, you gave him a determination to keep going, to press on, to not grow discouraged, and to not get complacent, complacent to where he was. God, if that's true for Paul, we need that even more. God, we, we often get knocked down by the um, difficulties of life, and we need your grace to get back up. So for a new year, a new decade, we ask, Lord, that you would give us the strength to do that, to pursue you, to have the right goal in mind that is worth pursuing, to have a godly goal. And I pray that you would have spoken to each and every person here one thing that they need to forget, to uh, give over to oblivion, and one thing to pursue, to strain towards, so that we could see you do a good work in our life for this new year. Help us have a clear vision, a purpose for our life to, to pursue the things of God, to keep our eyes heavenward in Christ Jesus. For it's in his name we pray, amen.